Um, the, uh, it's a pleasure to speak to you about uh, these exciting times in HIV prevention. Uh, people are beginning to speak about the end of AIDS transmission or HIV transmission in the world. This is based um, not really ent uh, entirely on pre-exposure prophylaxis, rather it's based on, on, on several discoveries uh, related to the, how suppressive antiretroviral treatment uh, renders people non-infectious, how male circumcision can prevent acquisition of HIV among heterosexual men, how pre-exposure prophylaxis can protect men who have sex with men and uh, heterosexual men and women, and how uh, successful rollout of, of treatment for pregnant women can virtually eliminate pediatric AIDS. So we are in a time when we can imagine uh, the end of AIDS transmission. And um, I'd just like to walk through some of the data that contributed to that optimism uh, and, uh, and then take questions. The Economist uh, has generally had a pessimistic view of ending the HIV epidemic. Uh, they see it as um, uh, the epidemic as a black hole for investment, uh, more and more money going in, more and more infections, uh, and, and little to believe that this is a sustainable uh, fight against HIV. This all changed this last year with this uh, cover story, this editorial in which they uh, they title it uh, The End of AIDS, and um, they conclude that it's now a question of money, uh, and they say it has been a long haul, but AIDS can be beaten. A plague that 30 years ago was blamed on man's iniquity has ended up showing him in a better, more inventive, and generous light. The UN AIDS estimates that the HIV pandemic continues to spread. Uh, with uh, 2.6 million a new HIV infections in 2009. 41% occur in young people between the ages of 15 and 24. Uh, I'd like to stop at this point and ask for a show of hands. Uh, do we have anyone in the audience between the age of 15 and 24? <laughs> uh, uh, oh, great, we have one. <laughs> Two. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, usually there are none. And um, in the prevention field, we often find ourselves as one group uh, talking about how another group of people should behave. And, um, and, and I think it, that is the root cause of some of our frustration uh, in HIV prevention. So welcome, you uh, 15 to 24-year-olds. You need to tell us how to do this. That same year, UNAIDS estimated that 1.2 million uh, people started therapy for the first time. Um, uh, the, this was a banner year for the treatment rollout, 30% new treatment starts than uh, in previous years. Uh, but still, there were two new HIV infections for everyone starting therapy. Men who have sex with men are, have carry a disproportionate burden of the epidemic. Um, uh, this is a meta-analysis published by uh, Dr. Baral uh, several years ago now. Uh, the blue line indicates uh, where a point estimate of HIV prevalence would be if the uh, if men who have sex with men in the general population had the same prevalence. You can see that all of the blue dots, all of the estimates of HIV infection prevalence fall well to the right of this blue line, in fact indicating a 19.3-fold higher odds of infection. Uh, what's impressive here is that this is really true around the world. Uh, we've known this to be true uh, of our urban centers in the United States, uh, but it turns out also to be true in Brazil, uh, throughout uh, the Americas, uh, Africa, Asia, and, uh, and Europe. There have been multiple prevention trial disappointments. Uh, intensive counseling uh, was not better than standard risk reduction counseling. An adenovirus vectored vaccine was not protective. Uh, a series of microbicides failed to show uh, benefit. Uh, a few may have shown some harm. Uh, diaphragms were not protective. Mass uh, treatment for sexually transmitted infections was not protective. Uh, and herpes suppression, either uh, in a variety of circumstances, was not protective. So uh, it's been a long road to get to any success in the prevention field. Uh, but I think we're there, and we've uh, heard some of this data from before. Male circumcision uh, does help protect heterosexual men. In observational studies, male circumcision was associated with less risk of HIV. 
Uh, and uh, that led to three randomized clinical trials, all done in heterosexual African men. Uh, and these trials demonstrated a reduction in HIV risk by 50 to 60 percent, again, in heterosexual men. Uh, male circumcision is extremely cost effective, uh, about $100 per surgery. Obviously, that varies depending uh, on the clinical facilities. But that one intervention leads to lifelong partial protection. So adherence um, to this uh, intervention is not the issue. Um, however, it's not expected to benefit men who have sex with men. 95% uh, of infections among uh, gay men and trans women occur after rectal exposure, not after exposure to the penis. And, um, and uh, we think this is why male circumcision has not been associated with uh, lower HIV prevalence among gay men. And, uh, and this is partly why it was not evaluated uh, in randomized clinical trials. Still, a clear success that plays, uh, will play a growing role uh, in helping to control the epidemic in Africa. What about antiretroviral treatment? Um, uh, this, uh, this idea of expanding uh, use of antiretroviral treatment to lower people's viral load and their infectiousness for their seronegative partner has been around for quite a while. As early as 1993, Musico et al. had shown that AZT, even a drug um, uh, with limited antiviral activity like AZT could decrease transmission from um, an uh, infected partner to their negative partner. Uh, but I think that the epidemiology has grown over the years suggesting that suppressive therapy would uh, markedly decrease infectiousness. That inspired uh, cities like San Francisco to roll out antiretroviral therapy. So it's been policy since 2004 that anyone with an HIV infection diagnosis should be offered uh, uh, at least three drug regimens um, upon diagnosis. Uh, so early therapy has been policy. And we see here evidence of the success of this treatment approach. The, uh, on the left figure, we see the um, mean months or mean time from diagnosis to uh, starting antiretroviral treatment in light purple and uh, the time from starting uh, from diagnosis to virologic suppression in uh, dark purple and you can see from 2004 to 2009 that um, these uh, there's been huge success in treating everyone who's diagnosed uh, such that uh, people are suppressed within a year uh, much less than a year of being diagnosed and therapies are more successful uh, on the right-hand side, we see the proportion of uh, treated people who have uh, virologic suppression, and uh, at this point in San Francisco, it's nearing 100 percent. This uh, based on work by the San Francisco Department of Public Health, uh, led by Mup uh, Mupali Das. And over this same time, in this graph, we see uh, the number of HIV diagnoses made in San Francisco. Uh, it's been decreasing here in the purple line. Uh, it decreased uh, particularly between 2004 and 2006 and may have hit uh, a slower rate of decay after that. Uh, we think at this point that uh, a large portion, perhaps as many as 50 percent, of the new infections in San Francisco are being driven by acutely infected people. And, uh, and because of this, uh, early therapy uh, will have limited effect because in, uh, even with aggressive promotion of therapy, uh, we cannot treat people who do not yet know that they're infected and do not yet have uh, positive antibody tests. I think definitive proof that uh, suppressive therapy decreases infectiousness came last year uh, with the uh, publication of the HPTN052 study, uh, which was performed uh, uh, partly here in Brazil, uh, uh, which contributed very important data to that study. Uh, through the leadership of the Fiocruz organization. Uh, and this was published by Michael Cohen. Essentially, the study design was to um, recruit stable, healthy HIV serodiscordant couples who are sexually active, um, who had a CD4 count between 350 and 550, and randomized them to either uh, start antiretroviral therapy immediately or to delay heart uh, antiretroviral therapy until WHO criteria were met, namely CD4 count of 250. Primary transmission was the endpoint. 
uh, particularly of virologically linked transmission events. So when the couple transmitted to each other, and that was evident by phylogenetic analysis of the virus strains. The primary clinical endpoint was uh, pulmonary tuberculosis, stage four clinical events, and severe uh, bacterial infection and death. So there were 39 transmission events, uh, four in the immediate arm, immediate treatment arm, and 35 in the delayed arm, a highly statistically significant result. Uh, when the data, the transmission events were analyzed according to whether they were linked, that is whether the uh, partnership actually um, um, transmitted one to the other, uh, there were 28 linked uh, transmissions, only one in the immediate arm and 27 in the uh, delayed arm. Importantly, there were 11 transmissions that occurred within these discordant couples uh, that originated from outside the partnership. And these were uh, initially monogamous couples, so uh, I think that this highlights how as many as 25 to 28 percent of infections will occur outside of the primary uh, partnership that the person uh, has. Uh, this has been observed in uh, male couples uh, as well as heterosexual couples. Uh, early treatment does not have any direct benefit for transmissions that occur from outside the partnership. What about the one case of a couple that transmitted uh, despite uh, starting early uh, therapy? Uh, in this case, the partner was identified to be HIV infected serologically at day 85, and the virus was analyzed uh, with respect to its viral diversity, and a um, and, um, uh, uh, look back was performed and to estimate when the infection originally occurred. And the estimate is that it occurred around the time of enrollment in the study. And so this is not necessarily a failure of early treatment um, uh, to, well, it would be a failure of early treatment to start, to stop infections that have already occurred at the time treatment starts. And so that's a por important caveat that um, sometimes there is a significant delay between uh, when infection occurs and when we can detect it. So what are the limitations of this approach, which sometimes is called test and treat? Well, um, testing, widespread testing and treating is challenging. Even in a resource, uh, well-resourced area like the United States, only about 30 percent of people with HIV infection are receiving suppressive therapy. Uh, and this is related to limited testing, uh, limited referrals to care, acceptance of care, retention in care, and treatment responses. Stigma or exclusion of uh, seropositive people drives much of the failure to uh, achieve successful treatment. Uh, 30 to 50, uh, but uh, an, another important limitation of the test and treat strategy is that 30 to 50 percent of new infections arise from other acutely infected people. And uh, early treatment, even when aggressively promoted, will not get to people when they're in the RNA positive. Uh, antibody negative period in the first few weeks or days of infection when they're so highly infectious to other people and they don't yet, they do not yet know that they're infected. Uh, this approach does require lifelong therapy. To date, we do not have a way of curing HIV infection. Work is being done. Uh, the seronegative person, uh, uh, from the point of view of the seronegative person, test and treat doesn't offer them an opportunity at all. Uh, they have to uh, know that their partner is positive. They must trust the partner to start and take therapy, and uh, there's no direct protection from contact outside the couple. So this particular approach does nothing to engage or motivate seronegative people uh, in the struggle to uh, stop the spread of HIV. So why have we been interested in chemoprophylaxis, both post- and pre-exposure prophylaxis, PEP, or PrEP, as they are called. Uh, well, we think that this approach is appropriate for people uh, whose partners may have acute infection, uh, have unknown serostatus, uh, are not treated, or not treated effectively. Uh, we also think that it is um, appropriate for, um, that, that it may inspire an active approach to HIV prevention uh, by reducing stigma, by breaking the disease drug link, and uh, that it could be an option for couples. Um, uh, in addition, chemoprophylaxis would not interfere with sexual practices in the way that condoms can. Why pre-exposure prophylaxis? Well, I think our interest in pre-exposure pro prophylaxis was um, inspired in large measure by this study uh, done by, uh, led by Mauro Schechter here uh, in Brazil, in Rio de Janeiro. 
uh, he noted, as many of us have, that very few people look or try to find post-exposure prophylaxis. Uh, it's, it's available in many places uh, of the world, many cities, but people just don't go out and look for it. And it's been argued that this is because of barriers to access, that if, uh, if it was just more available, people would use it more. And so uh, Morrow hypothesized that uh, he could eliminate the barriers to access by taking 200 uh, men who have sex with men and giving them a starter pack of AZT and 3TC uh, to take home with them. Uh, and he followed this cohort for 24 months. And he found, uh, after that observation period, that there were three groups. Uh, there was a group that didn't, uh, on the right here, in the right-hand column, that there was a group that did not use PEP, uh, but they did not have high-risk uh, exposures, and there were no infections. So all good there. About a quarter of the cohort was like that. Uh, on the far left, we see a group that uh, used post-exposure prophylaxis after high-risk sex, and there was only one uh, infection out of 68 individuals in that group, uh, cumulative inf uh, infection rate of 1.5 percent. But importantly, the largest group of the 200 were people who had taken home with them AZT, 3TC, PEP starter pack, um, and they had high-risk sex, but they did not start the pills. Uh, there were 10 infections in that group out of 86 for a cumulative incidence of 11.6%. So the largest group of people were those who um, didn't, did not use PEP even though they had it with them and even though they needed it. The reasons were that they thought they were safe because they were with their primary partner. Uh, their friends advised them against it. They were concerned about side effects. They thought the exposure was low risk. So this work, more than any other paper published, drove us to understand the limitations of post-exposure prophylaxis. People have a very difficult time recognizing when they've been exposed, and even if they have some idea that they could have been exposed to HIV, they have a difficulty acting on that knowledge. Um, it, let's face it, it's scary, it's frightening, people don't do it. Uh, so our idea is to try to make people more like Ulysses. Ulysses was a very wise man. He was coming home from the Trojan Wars, and uh, he knew that he had to meet the sirens uh, who uh, would tell him how to get home, but he also knew that the sirens had a, a very tempting um, habit of, of, of drawing people off of the boat down into the water where they would drown. Um, so uh, he prepared himself for this temptation, and um, so he tied himself to the mask, and he stuffed the ears of his crew so his crew would not be tempted to uh, jump off the boat when they heard the beautiful uh, sounds of the sirens. And, uh, and, and by preparing in this way and seeking out social support, he was able to hear the sirens um, and uh, sail away home. So this is what we'd like to see uh, in, in, uh, in people. We'd like to see people preparing for temptations, which we all know will occur, and uh, to prepare for them at a time when they can make um, calm decisions and, and, and plan to do the right thing, and to, and to talk to their friends and family to get support for their plans. So this is exactly what we want, and PrEP, we think, is just, um, uh, just what we need. So why, uh, why use tenofovir and imtricitabine? There are several drug classes that now are available that could be used. Uh, entry inhibitors, uh, integrase inhibitors, I think, are some of the most promising. Uh, but we uh, and others so, uh, elected tenofovir and imtricitabine because it was um, the safest uh, drugs available at the time. They had been demonstrated to be protective in non-human primates. Uh, they're licensed for human use for treatment. Uh, which will make scale-up of availability for prevention easier. They have an excellent safety record, long half-lives in the body, providing some forgiveness for missed doses. They're known to be concentrated in the rectum, which is the primary uh, mucosa that is infected uh, in, um, in, uh, in gay men. Uh, and there's no interactions with TB medications. Uh, these are data from Patterson et al. in Science Translational Medicine demonstrating an, a really important characteristic of tenofovir, that it accumulates to high levels in the rectal mucosa, both as the uh, prodrug, or uh, the drug tenofovir, as well as the uh, active metabolite, tenofovir diphosphate, or TFVDP. You can see in the black um, bars here that um, the co rectal concentrations are about 20-fold higher than is observed in the blood. 
um, uh, FTC and FTC triphosphate uh, penetrate well into uh, both the rectum and the, uh, and the female genital tract. So the two drugs together have an advantage of getting where they need to be. But importantly, this, this effect of tenofovir, we think, um, uh, is going to make it especially effective for men who have sex with men uh, because it is concentrated in the rectum. The mechanism turns out uh, likely to be, not, uh, uh, to be related to a limitation of these drugs. Tenofovir uh, disaproxyl fumarate is only 24% bioavailable, which means that 76% uh, of the drug passes unabsorbed uh, from the uh, small intestine into the rectum, uh, where we think it is available to uh, be absorbed and to coat uh, the, the surface of the rectal mucosa. So these are the data uh, that I'm sure you've seen, but we can go over them again. Uh, from repeated challenge models uh, performed at the Centers for Disease Control by uh, Walid Hanini and, and, and others in the group. Um, and, and these data show that, um, that either tenofovir and emtricitabine have protective effects, delaying uh, the acquisition of, SI, of a SHIV virus infection, but that the two drugs together uh, showed the highest uh, protective effects. So this is one of the reasons why uh, most of the studies in the field have, have analyzed uh, both drugs. So our IPREX study, the one that um, Esper uh, participated in, as well as uh, Valdilea Veloso's group at Fiocruz and Mauro Schechter in, in Rio de Janeiro, was funded by the NIH and the Gates Foundation with drug donated by Gilead Sciences. It enrolled men who have sex with men and trans women who were randomized one-to-one -to, -one to daily oral prep with either uh, co-formulated uh, uh, FTC TDF versus placebo, and they were followed monthly for HIV seroconversion, adverse events, metabolic effects, hepatitis B flares, um, risk behavior and sexually transmitted infections, adherence, drug resistance, viral load, and um, immune responses in CD4 counts. The study was fully enrolled as of December 2009 at 11 sites around the world. Uh, there were 2,499 enrolled. Um, uh, again, we had study sites in Thailand, South Africa, Brazil, Peru, Ecuador, and the United States. And, uh, and the intervention was efficacious. The efficacy on an intention-to-treat basis was 42 percent, with a confidence interval of the estimate from 18 to, to 60 percent, and that's through the end of the study. Uh, there were 83 infections in the placebo arm and 48 in the active arm for 35 infections averted, a statistically significant result with a p-value of 0 0.002. We had about 8% uh, of the cohort that was followed out to 144 weeks. The average follow-up was 1.7 years, so a substantial period of time. There was efficacy in most subgroups uh, defined by age, level of education, region of the world, uh, and alcohol use. The only subgroup that had a uh, different or differential efficacy was uh, by risk at baseline. The uh, group that reported unprotected receptive anal intercourse at baseline had a very much more substantial protective effect compared to those who were using condoms consistently. So this actually ends up being a convenient way to target this intervention. Uh, PrEP is appropriate for those who need it. It's not appropriate for those who are using condoms consistently and feel confident that they will continue to do so. Uh, this is a, uh, to try to understand when PrEP was working, when it was protective, when it wasn't. We did a case control study nested within the IPREX cohort that analyzed drug exposure and HIV risk. All active arm seroconverters were enrolled and matched to seronegative controls three to one by site and study time. Uh, viable cryopreserved peripheral blood mononuclear cells were analyzed for tenofovir diphosphate and emtricitabine triphosphate. Um, the use of viable cryopreserved PBMCs did uh, give uh, measurements of these drugs which were 2.8 fold lower than measurements that would be obtained with freshly lysed cells, so that's an important caveat. But we used the same methods throughout the study for both cases and controls. Uh, the plasma was analyzed um, um, again using mass spec, tandem mass spec, um, with, for tenofovir and emtricitabine. Detection was concordant in 95 percent. So we either detected one of the drugs, uh, we either detected none of the drugs and drug moieties, or we detected all of them. 
in 95% um, of the cases. So these are the, uh, on the y-axis, the, the uh, percentage of the cases and controls with any drug detected. And, um, and on the x-axis is time, but time relative to the first evidence of HIV infection in the case. And uh, you can see here that, um, disappointingly, actually, only 40 to 50 percent of the active arm controls had any detectable drug from visit to visit. Uh, this was a subgroup of the cohort that were taking it fairly consistently. There was another approximately 50 percent who never had drug at any time point. Um, we think that they just uh, didn't understand why they should continue to take a pill even though it might be a placebo and even though it might be a drug that had no known benefit for them. Uh, this was a very young cohort having an average age of 24 uh, and, uh, and, and we think that over time they just um, did not see why they should continue taking a pill every day under that circumstance. But importantly, the cases, the seroconverters, had even less drug, especially around the time of their acquisition of HIV. Uh, only 8% of that cohort of the seroconverters had any detectable drug. So drug detection was strongly correlated with HIV risk in the active arm of Iprex, um, uh, representing, uh, so detection of drug was associated with a 92% reduction in HIV risk with a 95% confidence interval of 71 to 99%. And this was, uh, this had to be controlled because uh, an analysis like this can be confounded. There may be uh, factors that are linked with better adherence and safer sex. Um, but we don't think that there is confounding in this analysis because uh, we, um, the estimate of the protective effect of having drug detected uh, did not change after controlling for age, unprotected receptive anal intercourse at baseline and follow-up, the numbers of partners at baseline, body mass index, or schooling. In fact, if anything, people who are having higher risk behavior were more frequently found to have detectable drugs. So we do not see um, this imagined thing, the organized personality that's going to be safe and adherent at the same time. We see the opposite. We see people will take PrEP when they need it the most. Um, drug detection was uh, evident in 94 percent at the U.S. sites, so we do see uh, evidence of higher drug detection. So this is, uh, we became interested in how much drug was re required to confer protection. So this is an exponential regression of the tenofovir diphosphate level in the peripheral blood uh, compared to HIV incidence in the IPREX study. And you can see that the uh, risk of HIV decreases um, very quickly and at very low concentrations of tenofovir. So how many pills need to be taken to achieve these concentrations? We learned this from a collaboration with Albert Liu uh, in uh, a study that he performed called the STRAND study. And let me see if I can get it to come up. Oh, there it is. Um, so uh, in, in the bars here, uh, so Albert Liu's strand study used directly observed therapy of two doses of tenofovir a week uh, versus four doses of tenofovir per week versus seven doses per week. And the range, uh, the interquartile range of uh, tenofovir concentrations achieved with these three dosing schemes is indicated with the um, uh, colored bars. And so you can see that um, already with only two doses per week, we're achieving concentrations that in IPREX were associated with a 76 percent reduction in uh, acquisition of HIV compared to the placebo arm. Four doses per week uh, were associated with concentrations that um, conferred 96 percent reduction in HIV acquisition and seven doses per week were associated with 99% reduction in HIV risk. So um, this uh, PrEP worked in IPREX, even though the concentrations observed were relatively low. We think that if people took uh, a, a, even four or more pills per week, they were highly protected in the IPREX study. We became interested in understanding under what circumstances people were taking drug and what circumstances they were not. These are the key findings so far. First of all, uh, as on the left-hand side, we see the, what I just described, which was that drug detection was very infrequent among those who became infected uh, and uh, only present in 44 percent of the seronegative controls. Importantly, on the left-hand side, we see that the tenofovir levels were low even in those three, those 8 percent 
who had detectable drug. It was low in all of them. Um, we see a marked difference in region. If we look at the U.S., we see 94 percent of the active arm having detectable drug versus 43 percent at sites outside of the U.S. Um, importantly, there is an age difference. The U.S. sites uh, recruited uh, individuals having an average age of 35 compared to an age of 24 outside of the U.S. Age is, uh, w uh, older participants were more likely to take drug uh, consistently, 53 percent versus 37 percent. And this is the other finding, that, um, that some people just stopped having sex. Um, this happens even in high-risk cohort and uh, happens in IPREX about 20 to 30 percent of the, of the cohort. And uh, if they haven't had sex in the last several months, um, they become even less interested in taking a pill a day for preventing HIV. Still, 38 percent did. Um, among those who had sex but were consistently using condoms, that is, no unprotected receptive anal sex, the drug exposure was 42 percent, and it goes up to 53 percent among those reporting the highest risk exposure. So again, we do not see an association between safer sex and uh, drug adherence. We see the opposite, that people will take these drugs when they need them the most. In the U.S., we've, we've had two PrEP studies and so far no seroconversions uh, in, uh, during PrEP use. So what about viral load and drug resistance? We do not see that seroconverters uh, after using PrEP uh, have a different viral load. In fact, it's very similar. Even at the seroconversion visit when they said, when they reported that they were taking PrEP, um, we do not see evidence of drug resistance among those with emergent infection, that is, that group who were uninfected at baseline and became infected during PrEP use. There was no entracitabine or tenofovir drug resistance. There were three cases of drug resistance to emtricitabine, uh, two in the active arm and two in the placebo arm. Bo uh, all three of these occurred in people who were infected at enrollment, and their infection was not detected because they were in the antibody negative period of of acute infection. So um, uh, we were interested in knowing what happened in these two cases of emtricitabine resistant um, virus infections. Uh, but first, how do we go about avoiding starting PrEP in people who are already infected with HIV? I think it's important to emphasize, especially for the physicians and nurses in the room, that acute HIV infection is almost always symptomatic. Uh, the symptoms are nonspecific. Uh, but somewhere between 80 to 100 percent of people with acute HIV infection will have symptoms severe enough to make them seek medical attention. Uh, and that was also true in IPREX. Um, of the 10 people with acute infection at baseline enrollment, s uh, five had a viral syndrome. Two were symptomatic within one week, which motivated them to come back and see their doctors. One had an anal sore that was new, and two had leukopenia. So all of them had some sign or symptom. That's the, I mean, the, the helpful news in, in one way. But the, the downside of this is that these symptoms are very nonspecific. Um, they are flu-like illnesses, sore throat, pharyngitis, myalgias. They're very difficult to distinguish from uh, upper respiratory tract infections and GI distress. So what happens if uh, PrEP is started in people who are already infected? Well, as, as expected, we see some FTC resistance, and we see uh, this in two of our IPREX study participants. Um, and here on the graphs, we see uh, time on the x-axis and the viral load in red, and the proportion of the virus population that is drug resistant in blue. And in both cases, uh, PrEP selected for an FTC-resistant variant, either M184V or M184I resistance mutations. Uh, these uh, resistance mutations persisted as the predominant variant for four to eight weeks after PrEP was stopped, uh, but then they wane within six months to levels below 0.5 percent. The clinical relevance of these low-lying uh, drug-resistant variants is not known. Um, and, uh, and, and it needs to be investigated separately. So what is the summary of evidence that there is no or low drug exposure among active arm seroconverters in the IPREX study? Well, there's no suppression of plasma viral RNA, no selection for drug resistance, and no detectable drug in 91 percent. 
and in the other 8 to 9 percent, the levels of drug are low, lower than the median in the seronegative uh, converters. So we have yet to see a bona fide case of HIV infection uh, in someone actually taking PrEP um, at this time. So what about long-term toxicities? The main concern with antiretroviral drugs uh, is, is bone, uh, its effect on bone. It's known that all antiretroviral drugs have some uh, effect on decreasing bone mineral density. Uh, tenofovir may have a, a more potent effect on bone than the other drug classes. So uh, this was evaluated in a nested case, con a nested sub-study of the IPREX um, uh, study. And in this nested study of 503 uh, study participants, we see the following results. These are uh, serial DEXA scans. Um, looking at bone mineral density at the spine and the total hip. Uh, the, um, the active arm is associated with about a 1% uh, less bone mineral density than the placebo arm, 1% uh, at both the spine and the hip. The, the difference is observed mainly at week uh, 24, and it persists but does not progress after that. Importantly, though, when we look at what proportion of the cohort would reached a clinically relevant threshold of bone mineral density, which is defined here as a z-score less than negative two, uh, defined by the International Society for Clinical Densitometry. Um, uh, we see that there's no difference in um, the proportion of the cohort that reaches this clinically relevant threshold at either the hip or the spine. If anything, there's a trend toward the placebo arm uh, reaching the threshold more frequently. How, does, how do we explain this? Well, it turns out that the people who lose the most bone mineral density during PrEP are those who start off with the highest levels. And so uh, people who already had or were in the low end of the range of bone mineral density uh, lost less uh, bone mineral density associated with PrEP use. So uh, this is how we, exp uh, uh, what, this is what explains that there can be a 1% uh, decrease in bone mineral density on average, but it doesn't increase the rate of, of meeting or reaching a clinical threshold that's important. Fractures were equally distributed across the two groups. Um, so what is the bone mineral density change in prevention, and how does that compare to what we see during treatment? Um, the, um, these plots here plot the percentage change in bone mineral density at the spine and hip in the two prevention trials where this has been studied, uh, the CDC safety study uh, in, um, in, in yellow and the IPREX study in green. The other three lines in orange, blue, and red are treatment studies of HIV-infected persons. And uh, it's a pretty consistent pattern. In the treatment setting, we see a 3 to 4 percent loss in bone mineral density. Uh, at both the hip and the spine, whereas in the prevention setting, we see less than a 1 percent change in bone mineral density. So the, um, the difference between treatment and prevention, we think, uh, is, is mainly due to HIV. Uh, people receiving uh, treatment for HIV all are infected, and HIV infection itself is associated with loss in bone mineral density. Um, the, uh, the other is, is the third drug. The people receiving treatment are all receiving three and four drug regimens, and uh, the, the third drug in the regimen is also uh, associated with loss in bone mineral density. Finally, the difference may be adherence as well, that uh, in the prevention setting, uh, people don't have a disease, and uh, they take their drugs when they need them, uh, and uh, they may take less than someone who is um, taking medicine for uh, suppression of their viral load in treatment. So what about risk behavior? Um, this idea of risk compensation uh, has been called the Achilles heel of innovations in HIV prevention. The thought is that if people um, uh, are offered something that gives them a sense of security, they're just going to stop using condoms and have more sexual partners. and and there will not be any net benefit. Um, to be sure, this theory assumes a rational process in sexual decisions. Um, they, they, they never indicate why they think that sexual decisions are made rationally, but they assume it. Um, and, um, and, and it predicts that there would be increased risk behavior if there's decreased risk perception. We did not see any evidence of risk compensation in the IPREX study. Uh, the unprotected receptive intercourse was reported in a decreasing proportion of study subjects. 
This was true even if we look at the subset of subjects who thought they were on the active arm of the study, who were optimists. They did not guess correctly, by the way, that, uh, which arm they were in, but there was a group that thought they were on the active arm, and they behaved uh, in a safer way over the course of the study. And uh, condom use actually increased. Uh, we, don't, we, we think this is not simply uh, reporting bias or social desirability reporting bias, uh, because we can see decreases in the prevalence of acute HIV infection in both the placebo and the active arm during follow-up. A 3.8-fold decrease in the prevalence of acute infection in the, in the placebo arm and 6.5 in the, in the active arm. This is a, an instantaneous measure of HIV acquisition and is not biased by reporting and uh, provides uh, uh, objective evidence of risk reduction commensurate with the reported changes in behavior. So what about PrEP in women? Uh, there's four trials that are either finished or underway looking at pre-exposure prophylaxis in women, and we see mixed results. The Partners PrEP study uh, showed very high substantial uh, efficacy for both men and women. Uh, these are heterosexual men and women, 83% efficacy and 62%. The TDF2 study in Botswana reported 80% efficacy in men and 49% in women. But the FEMPREP study showed no uh, efficacy at all. Um, we now, as of uh, the retrovirus meeting last month, understand these results. Um, the um, prevalence of drug exposure in Partners PrEP was as high as 80 percent, uh, so commensurate with 80 percent efficacy, uh, whereas the FEMPREP prevalence of drug exposure was about 20 percent, uh, too low to evaluate the efficacy of the intervention. In general, as a rule of thumb, uh, the efficacy that you can expect in PrEP trials is approximately the prevalence of drug exposure in uh, people using PrEP. So in IPREX, about 45 percent of people had drug exposure. We saw efficacy 42 percent. It tracks one-to-one -one across all of these studies. PrEP works if people take it. Um, so there is interim guidance in the U.S. that's been issued by the Centers for Disease Control and the FDA is reviewing the prevention use of Trivada, and uh, we do expect a decision to be made by uh, the end of June this year. So there is a, a, a PrEP demonstration project ongoing, including here in Brazil. It's called IPREX OLE, and uh, it's to provide post-trial access in accordance with the Declaration of Helsinki and good participatory practices, uh, to listen to PrEP users about implementation issues, learn how PrEP use changes when people know uh, that the tablet is safe and effective and not a placebo, uh, learn what happens with sexual practices, and learn if every 12-week monitoring is sufficient. So what are the conclusions from IPREX? Uh, that oral FTC TDF provided additional protection to MSM receiving a comprehensive package of prevention services. There was a 42 percent risk reduction overall, 92 percent risk reduction if drug was detected. Uh, use was the key determinant of efficacy. There was no moderate or serious toxicity. So there's m many people to thank in a big project like this, performed at 11 sites around the world. I I'd like to particularly thank uh, Esper Kalas and his team here at uh, USPI, Valdilea Veloso at the Fiocruz organization, and Mauro uh, Schechter at, at Pras Onse. The Brazilian teams really did make this study uh, a global endeavor and uh, contributed high quality data and, and many inspiring uh, insights. The, um, the uh, study was sponsored by the National Institutes of Health with co-funding from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and um, Gilead donated drug but did not pay for the study. But mainly, we'd like to thank the participants. Uh, this work uh, was made possible by 2,499 participants and their communities who believe that research could improve their lives. Thank you. <laughs>